Hello, hello, this is Mike Test. So, Mr. Alejandro Solano, can you hear me? Connection test. Hello, Mr. Alejandro Solano. Okay, then Miss Adriana Labadini, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you well. Yeah, I can hear you too. Okay, thank you. So could you show your camera? Turn on your camera. Okay, okay, we can see you. Thank you. Mr. Alejandro Solano, can you hear me? Hi, I can hear you. Okay. Hi, everyone. I can hear you too. Thank you. Could you turn on your camera? Okay, I can see you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, so with this, we are very pleased to start this workshop on financing broadband networks of the future. So good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, hello to the participants in the room. Um, as I said, don't be shy. Join us at the table, um, participate in the discussion. Hello to all the people uh, connected online. You know, thanks for being with us for this workshop. Um, so basically, I want to introduce uh, my colleague um, Hokuto and the colleague Max. They're joining online, so they are really behind the organization of this panel. So I would like to thank you beforehand. Now, without further ado, um, I'll provide you know uh, quickly like the floor, like give you some remarks about what we're here for today. Uh, we'll then uh, introduce um, our panelists and. Um, hopefully have a very uh, interesting discussion. So, I mean, the IGF is probably um, the best way to show that, uh, you know, I think we all agree that, you know, without connectivity, you can't have the digital transformation of our economies and societies. And I think there is really wide agreement, not only in this conference, um, but, you know, also worldwide. So if we all agree, uh, then really the question is, you know, how do we make sure um, that we have uh, ubiquitous high-level connectivity at affordable prices so that everyone can participate in this digital transformation. Um, so the question is, you know, how can we make sure we have enough funding that goes into broadband networks um, everywhere in the world? So that means the amount of funding that we're putting in the networks today will basically define the quality of service we're getting today and tomorrow. Um, it will define where we're getting the service, it will define the coverage. Um, so this is something, uh, you know, which is, we can't do without it. Now, um, at the OECD, we've started to look a bit at this question, you know, like uh, if we look at investments in broadband networks, how can we quantify that? And what we discovered is that there are actually a lot of players in the ecosystem that have a lot to say. Uh, I mean, starting with uh, the communication operators, and we have one connected online today. I mean, they are taking, uh, obviously, the heavy lifting of investments. Uh, but then, you know, we see that there are obviously very important other groups. So we see that a lot of government funding these days is getting into broadband, in particular in rural and remote areas. So we have important funds that are currently deployed in the United States um, to bridge coverage gaps. Um, in the recovery packages that we see all around the world, uh, including in Europe, a lot of funds are going broadband, so it's a different source of financing, but it's also helping to extend connectivity. Uh, then obviously uh, we have the tech companies that are investing uh, quite a bit on their side, and we'll hear more about it in a second. Uh, and we have new players. So we have pension funds, we have private equity, uh, that invest a lot in wholesale access networks. So we're seeing this in Germany, we're seeing this in Latin America. Um, so again, an additional player. So um, basically, you know, um, so what we want to do in this workshop is take a holistic approach, hear, you know, from the different players, um, how we can ensure that, you know, enough investments go into broadband infrastructure. And without further ado, uh, I'm very privileged um, to have um, uh, impressive and high-level speakers in this panel. 
Um, so um, I'll start with uh, Ms. Agne Vaichu Chikvichuchi. I trained, uh, so Deputy Minister of Transport and Communication of the Republic of Lithuania. Welcome to the panel. Uh, we are having uh, Mrs. Maki Takahashi with us. Uh, she is a Principal Deputy Director of the Telecommunications Policy Division, uh, Telecommunications Business Department of the Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications, MIC of Japan. Um, then we have uh, joining us online, Mr. Alejandro Solano Diaz, who is the CFO of Onet Fibra Colombia. Um, equally online, we have uh, Adriana Labardini joining us uh, from the Association for Progressive Communications Policy and Regulation, uh, and who is the coordinator uh, the region for uh, regulation in LAC for Rizomatica IPC. And we have uh, Mr. Kojo Boyachi, who is the Vice President of Public Policy for Africa, Middle East, and Turkey from Meta. So to kick off the discussion, uh, I'd like to ask all the panelists um, an introductory question. So um, what is your view, um, what is the organization, uh, you know, the view of the organization you're representing currently here uh, on investing uh, in broadband networks? And uh, so how are you basically supporting the rollout of broadband networks? Uh, and I'd like to start uh, with Maki, please. Hi, uh, this is Maki Takahashi uh, from the Ministry of Internal, uh, Internal Affairs and Communication in Japan. And thank you very much for inviting me today. And so I'd like to start my intervention uh, from, um, by highlighting the importance of the broadband connectivity. It's universal all over the world. And so it, the government of each country uh, play an important role. And, but that role differs uh, depending on the situation uh, of the countries. And so my country in Japan, uh, I could say um, high quality broadband uh, has already prepared. For example, 19, uh, for uh, fixed broadband, 99.8% um, coverage, uh, population coverage, and for 5G, 93.2% uh, of the population coverage. And then, uh, so our cha current challenge uh, is to promote investment uh, to the areas where investment wouldn't come naturally. And to support uh, or spur the investment uh, to these areas, uh, for us, um, setting up career goal uh, is important. And so MIC um, uh, set up uh, the National Broadband Connectivity Plan this year, uh, last year and also revised this year uh, to set up a career goal and also measures to be taken. And for example, under this plan, uh, we will uh, aim uh, for fixed broadband, 99.9% .9 of the coverage. It's only like 0.1 coverage difference, and but it's really, really hard part. <laughs> and also uh, for 5G, 95% uh, uh, by the end of the fiscal uh, year 2025, and 99% uh, by the end of the fiscal year 2030. And not only uh, this um, land broadband, uh, for us, uh, is, uh, for us, like a country uh, like mine and uh, Japan, support uh, surrounded by sea, and also unfortunately faces a lot of natural disaster. Uh, not only land uh, broadband infrastructure, um, this pra um, this plan covers uh, also submarine cable and also NTN, uh, non terrestrial network. And so, for example, the uh, submarine cable um, due to the um, geographical and for our future, um, landing station uh, concentrate uh, on the Pacific Ocean side. And so we, so we will support the companies uh, who invest landing station on the Japan sea side. Uh, and also uh, for the uh, non-terrestrial network, um, because it's a new technology, uh, it's starting. And so we will uh, the plan the bills, our intention uh, to support uh, demonstrative experiment uh, to the NTN. And also uh, we will um, now working on the um, legislative changes uh, for the um, NTN to support in schools introduction. Thank you very much uh, for those impressive numbers from Japan. Uh, Deputy Minister Agni, what do you think? 
Uh, so, uh, hello everyone. I'm a deputy minister from uh, Lithuania, and uh, under my portfolio, there is all the communications related questions. So, thank you very much for, for OECD and uh, Japan for inviting us and creating this opportunity to be a part of this discussion. Um, so, uh, I think my colleague mentioned uh, some uh, very important uh, aspects. It's really important. Uh, you know, on the government uh, and on the country itself, uh, what is the status quo and uh, where we are coming from. So uh, I do believe that Lithuanian case is a very good uh, case of public and private sectors collaboration. And I think that this is a key in order to roll out broadband networks and to achieve the connectivity goals. Um, the role of uh, Lithuanian government, I think, should be more focused on legal and regulatory ecosystem, on creating this ecosystem, which could bring the value for all, uh, while uh, private sector should complement the government's efforts. And uh, um, uh, just to brag a little bit about Lithuanian numbers as well, uh, we do have uh, very high numbers in the rollout of fixed, very high capacity network at the moment. Uh, which is exceeds European Union level, as well as fiber to the premises, which is uh, really exceeds uh, the EU um, average level. And with the 5G, the coverage is almost the same as in Japan, so I'm really proud. It's around 90% of population is already covered. We achieved it uh, within the very close cooperation with operators just recently, last year. And uh, we hope we will uh, take a step forward in the near future. Now we're mainly focusing on enabling access to gigabit broadband infrastructure. So our idea is to uh, cover all main uh, uh, digitally sensitive users uh, within the next five years. And we already allocated the funds uh, from the government to do so. So thank you very much, and maybe later on we'll be able to elaborate a little bit more. Well, thank you very much. So we heard from, I would say, two of our uh, OECD leaders when it comes to uh, fiber penetration. Um, so I'd like to turn to Adriana. So we heard a lot from the government perspective. Um, Adriana, what's your take? What's the role of civil society uh, you know, in ensuring that enough investment goes into broadband networks? Thank you, Verena, and thank the OECD for inviting uh, APC to, uh, through, through me and, and Carlos Rey, who's all, also there, uh, the co-lead of our local networks uh, program. Well, APC and its partner organization, Rizomatica, have worked for six years, have been supporting the local networks program in three regions of the global south, and have been supporting many communities in 22 countries uh, under the understanding that the digital divide is not a problem the market alone will solve and that we need to do things differently to really expedite the, the closure of the digital divide, especially now after the pandemic lessons and the urgency to act and invest more sustainably with more uh, green finance <laughs> at the local level. For instance, APC has mapped uh, for, for five years now, a, a baseline, a baseline info to, ha to have data on the different community networks and other local networks around the global south. So that we know more about their operating models, their financial models, their capex and opex and, and ownership models. And more recently, APC, and I, I want to, to share this with all the audience, has co-funded an in-depth study titled Financing Mechanisms for Locally Owned Infrastructure to raise awareness in the financial community of what is a community uh, network or a community-driven connectivity operator. What are their values, their course trends, and how to contribute to their sustainability. It is a practical tool, this study, for those who want to build networks where the market hasn't, basically rural, remote, and suburban areas. But also it's a tool for funders and investors uh, caring about the planet, the environmental sustainability, and the social sustainability 
of uh, these communities. Uh, it demonstrates how underserved communities can build their own internet infrastructure and take control of their digital futures, promote circular economies, and empower themselves through capacity building. Uh, finally, APC, besides advocating for an enabling uh, policy environment and capacity building, and, and has been done a lot of grant making to, for, for these infrastructures in many communities. It, has also, it is also supporting a comparative study of the financial sus sustainability and socioeconomic impacts of alternative digital infrastructure connectivity business models. This study will draw us much more information on all these uh, different costs, which are much lower than large scale operators that successfully operate in more urban areas. Thank you very much. Thank you much. Thank you very much, uh, Adriana. And so we, we heard, you know, how basically local networks uh, are stepping into local communities. We'll look forward to reading the report uh, that you're currently preparing. Um, so let me turn to, to Kojo. So Meta, um, has, I think, uh, quite an important role when it comes to uh, infrastructure networks in Africa. So I'd be really eager to hear more about what you're doing there. Thanks so much, and, and thank you for, for having Meta attend and participate in what I think is an important discussion uh, in what I think is a beautiful location. It was very nice to drive up here, so thank you for the hospitality so far. Uh, as Verena mentioned, my name is Kojo Boachi. I'm Vice President of Public Policy for Africa, Middle East, and Turkey with Meta. This is an issue close to my heart that I've worked on for now 20 years. Some of these discussions are new and innovative and feel fresh. Some of them feel slightly stale and old. Uh, it's really, really nice to hear from the governments of both Japan and Lithuania about the targets they've reached. Uh, we are mindful, and I know discuss this discussion will explore it, that we have a number of other uh, goals to reach in terms of giving people uh, inclusive access. Um, Meta is trying in a number of ways, and I'll, I'll just talk about the network investments that are important at the moment. So I, I think many people know, or may not know, about the investments we've made, not only in uh, submarine cables, terrestrial fiber, uh, uh, CDNs, co-located caching, uh, and services, of course. Uh, and, and, and a lot of that goes, uh, uh, for me, goes uh, unspoken and I think we can do more as a company and partners can do more to, to, to speak about how much we've done in that area. Uh, of course, some of you don't know me and may question what impact are those investments having. Um, for those of you who are interested in raw numbers, I can tell you that we have, uh, we've done some studies with Analysis Mason and RTI who looked at the impact of just one cable that we've built that stretches from the US to Spain and found that within a year of that cable going live, that submarine cable live, it was contributing more than 16.8 billion, I believe, to uh, the economy. Uh, and we've, we, we're excited by that number, not only because of the impact it's already driving, but because of continued investments that we're making. We have two more cables coming online in 2024 and 2027 that will respectively add 32 billion and 27 billion to the economies of the countries involved in those. And why does that excite me? Verena said, well, I'm gonna speak about Africa only. These cables clearly aren't for Africa. But when you look at the investment that we've made alongside partners in two Africa, which will be the first cable to connect west to east or east to west via Southern Africa, bringing 180 terabytes of capacity, connecting 33 countries in the region and through to Europe, you can understand why we and many of the governments and civil society organizations, I see my colleague Onika there in the background, as well as the communities, and the lady from APC spoke so eloquently about the impact that these infrastructures are having on communities, you can understand why we're excited about these continued investments. So I'm not gonna wax lyrical about what else we're doing as Meta, but just a small snippet of what we're doing to invest in networks, I'd like to leave you with, that's okay, Verena. Great, thanks. And yeah, we can't wait to see these more, uh, these two ca um, fiber cables, you know, yeah. come into service. What was that next year and then the year 20, after? 2024 and then 2027. 
24 and 27. But to Africa is beginning to go live now, so anyone who hasn't kept abreast of those developments, please do, sorry. The to Africa cable is beginning to land now, and that's what we're incredibly excited about. As I mentioned, it's the redundancy that it will give the African continent, but also this additional capacity, this additional 180 terabytes of capacity that the continent will get. And we're proud, and I'm not going to brag too much, to say that this is the longest submarine cable in the world. So I just want to stress, please, uh, if you need more information on To Africa, please come and see me or feel free to Google it. Well, thanks so much, and I'm sorry to say Alejandro, but the pressure is up now for Latin America. Um, so we're turning to Alejandro. So Alejandro uh, is the CFO of one of the wholesale companies I mentioned. So um, Alejandro, tell us a bit more what you're doing, how you're connecting the Colombians and what your experience has been so far. Hi everyone, it is a privilege to be here with you in this discussion. The neutrality of fiber optic infrastructure in the world is a growing trend. Example of this are the creation of companies such as Fiber Cup in Italy, Hyperoptic in the UK, Open Dutch Fiber in the Netherlands, Mitronet in the US, and UGG in Germany. Precisely after seeing these opportunities around fiber optic broadband, broadband networks, and the huge potential of Latin American countries, KKR and Telefonica joined force to create a fully private own initiative of Connect Fibra Colombia, Chile, and soon in Peru. In Colombia, we were born in January 2022. And by the end of 2023, we will have invested approximately $240 million in network coverage and support systems. Similar amount has been invested by our college in Chile and soon in Peru. This investment plan are among the most relevant across Latin America. A proof of Onet Rivers' commitment to develop fiber to the home FTTH infrastructure to bridge the digital divide in, in the region and to enhance development opportunities for these countries and their communities. Colombia and Chile are currently investing in a monthly basis to expand the FTTH network coverage. Colombia has seen, has seen a network expansion of 175, measured by the number of households covered in January 2022. And in Chile, uh, Onet Fibra has grown the footprint approximately 40% over the initially, initially acquired network. So basically, we are a new, neutral fiber optic network, the lar largest one in Colombia, and we promote uh, the connectivity through our investment in fiber optics. Thank you. Thank you so much. And this was you know, really a speedy deployment that you're having in Colombia and Chile. Uh, congratulations on this one. Um, so we heard, you know, the different uh, perspective from different players, so we can see a lot is going on, right, by different players, and I think, you know, because this debate is currently going on in Europe, so it's really important, you know, to really listen to, to all of the players and their role in infrastructure investment. Now, going back to the government, um, Maki, um, so, you know, um, are there some best practices that you could share? You know, what worked well in Japan, given that you have quite impressive connectivity numbers, uh, and what are you doing next? Okay, thank you very much for the question. And so as our approach, uh, I'd like to highlight uh, four approaches uh, which have um, which we've taken and I uh, think are uh, effective. And so as I already told, our challenge is to promote investment in rural areas and first and second approach is for rural areas. And so first approach is subsidy. And so in my country, uh, the main player of the investment uh, is um, Carriers and also local governments. And for carriers, it's hard uh, to invest in the rural areas. And for local governments, uh, the lack of budget. And so, uh, government and uh, the MIC uh, support um, infrastructure de uh, deployment for fiber uh, for FD, uh, sorry uh, the fixed broadband uh, to. Uh, two thirds uh, of the deployment cost uh, for the local government and half uh, for the private companies. And we also have the similar um, subsidy scheme uh, for the mobile broadband uh, for um, base um, station and backward uh, back, um, and back, back net, net network infrastructure. And the second approach uh, is legal arrangement. 
And to keep the better quality of the broadband, uh, actually maintenance uh, is as important as deployment. And so for us, uh, we changed uh, telecommunication business law uh, this year uh, to introduce um, universal, serv universal service scheme for broadband. And under this scheme, um, broadband providers, mobile and fix, uh, they set up a fund uh, to sub uh, and this sub fund uh, support fixed fi uh, fix broadband uh, providers um, for the um, local, uh, rural, very rural areas to maintenance uh, to maintain uh, their infrastructure. And I hope that this scheme uh, help uh, help them keeping the uh, investment in the rural areas. And uh, looking at the past, I could say third and fourth um, approaches. Uh, it's one, a third uh, is competition policy, and fourth uh, is um, spectrum allocation processes. And uh, talking about the competition policy, uh, currently uh, we have four MNOs uh, in Japan, and um, we have introduced asymmetry regulation uh, to the carriers uh, with higher, uh, higher uh, higher shares. And so this uh, intensified the competition between carriers, and this is the big motivation for them to Im continuously invest their network uh, for better connectivity to their customers. And talking about the spectrum allocation, uh, at the time of the screening, uh, we ask uh, carriers, or we require carriers, uh, to submit uh, their coverage plan for five years, and then um, they are obliged uh, to submit um, periodically, and we check periodically. So this is another motivation for them uh, to keep uh, their investment. And I think uh, these four measures are uh, collaboratively uh, work well, and so I think uh, this uh, result uh, the higher our uh, better uh, network, broadband network coverage in my country. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Maki. So. Um, uh, as a deputy minister, you are both pointing out actually that the legal and the regulatory framework and competition policy is really crucial to make this happen. I also like the nudge on spectrum and how you go about this. Um, Wise minister, so, you know, what lessons can we learn from Lithuania? I mean, how do you go about rural and remote areas? Is wholesale also an issue that you're looking at? Um, I think that, uh, once again, uh, I really enjoy being uh, together with the Japanese colleagues. There is so, so, so many things in common from the government point of view. Obviously, uh, whether competition exists uh, in the... Uh, there is a competition, but when we speak about remote uh, areas or rural areas, is, uh, this is a key for us, for the government, uh, to ensure equal access to digital, digital opportunities and activities. And I would like to share a Lithuanian model. I think it's quite uh, unique and interesting. Uh, this model works for 18 years uh, already in Lithuania. So the government has established a non-profit company uh, which uses public funds and deploys broadband infrastructure in specifically rural areas. Nevertheless, the active infrastructure which is needed for the last mile uh, must be deployed by private operators um, because this nonprofit company offers services only for the operators uh, but not the end, end users. Mm, uh, so the concrete road of that network is negotiated in advance with operators. Uh, so everybody knows uh, you know, the rules of uh, how it's going to be built in the future. Um, and um, what is really important maybe to mention that the prices for the wholesale services are based on only on expenses. So there are about 40 operators uh, which buy more than uh, 5,800 units for wholesale services from this nonprofit company and then provide services for the end users. So this is uh, obviously very good for the market, for the operators. Uh, they really enjoy this kind of concept and I think that we separated it 18 years ago in a very mm, sophisticated manner and uh, which helps us to also be one of the ones ahead uh, in, in, in so many uh, aspects of the penetration. Uh, so this model helps uh, to attract uh, private investments to the remote and rural areas, uh, as I told, uh, because the biggest part of the investment lies on the shoulders of the government, uh, as it should be, because there is no economic, you know, viable model for them to, to go there. And um, 
and the same price uh, for the end user. So it's uh, it helps also not to uh, make it very expensive. I think you know the ultimate goal is the end users here, and uh, to create equal rights, uh, you know, for whatever place you are living in. And I think that uh, only a couple of countries have the same model. I think it works pretty well, and we're not planning to change it uh, uh, in in our future. Um, and this is example of Lithuania. Thank you very much. And so actually, we heard about um, two very interesting wholesale. Uh, models, you know, both from Lithuania um, and also from, well, Colombia, Chile, and Peru. Um, and we also heard about, you know, your very, it seems, seamlessly, seamlessly cooperation between uh, the public and the private sector. So now, if we add um, civil society to the game, Adriana, what would you say? I mean, what approaches can we craft as a multi-stakeholder community? So in your eyes, you know, what has worked? Or, you know, are there, are there ideas we should put on the table to further extend connectivity? Thank you, Verena. Well, first, I would say what triggers this virtuous cycle is when you uh, shift from an artificial scarcity system to a one of abundance. And for many years in the tel telecommunications sector, we have maintained this scarcity, scarcity to access spectrum, scarcity to access backbone networks that yes, have been built. We have tons of uh, submarine cables in Africa and huge backbones in Peru and Colombia, but the prices are prohibitive. So if there were, as OECD has recommended, much more open access policies to encourage uh, High, tra high volume of traffic uses networks because backbone and backhaul is a, a, an important ingredient uh, in the cost for, for a smaller operator. Sometimes it's even expensive, this backhaul for the large operators, even more for a local one. So, so that's the cost of spectrum. Having spectrum assigned always like in parcels for 20 years uh, with very expensive licenses, and then nobody's using it in, in rural. So that's also is creating a regulatory scarcity. Secondly, I would say that when it comes to the financial community, I think they deserve to be, to they don't, are not obliged to know everything about local networks, about the values, the strengths, and the models of community networks or, or cooperatives, municipal networks, et cetera. So we should be educating the financial community uh, or development banks around local infrastructures, small scale operators. They obey to different logics. And due to innovation, they don't, do not need an economies of scale so they can thrive and be sustainable. And, and through, with, through that education to new models and to recognize that this is in the 21st century, there is an expanded ecosystem of operators. It's no longer the times of one incumbent or two. We have uh, operators of different flavors, uh, wireless, wired, large, small, uh, fiber, uh, using Wi-Fi, cooperatives, uh, nonprofit community networks, large operators, et cetera. And so I think there should, this financial community should unlock grants and sub-commercial capital to community connectivity providers that are you know, financially ma mature and understand that first you receive a grant, then you receive a subsidy from USF funding, and then you probably can evolve to, to have equity. And this would benefit not only the, the local rural communities, but a whole country, because it would burst local economies and also burst uh, anti-global warming and unsustainable infrastructures. And finally, I would say that also, of course, it is important for communities to have more financial and management education uh, civil society, APC, Rizomatica, 
has put an, a huge investment in capacity building, forming indigenous uh, technical operators, uh, I mean, technical capacity building, managerial capacity building uh, for, for community networks in all the global south. And, and finally, I would say now that the financial community at the global level and also at the national level is playing a key role in sustainable finance, that is in green capital under ESG standards, I think it would be the perfect timing to look at local development models, local uh, solar energy, local telecom networks, meaning community networks, that are are more eco friendly, and that they could uh, and have much lesser costs and uh, environmental impact. So, in this new expanded uh, ecosystem of of players and operators, uh, I think uh, impact in, uh, impact investors funds. Uh, should also look at this non-for-profit players, just as OECD has recognized them and recommended them when there's market failures. ITU has recommended that states look at, at and, and promote with an enabling environment these community players. And so has uh, the OAS through CTEL and, and some development banks of, of like CAF and IADB. Thank you. Thank you, Adriana, and absolutely. And we actually have um, more important community players in the yes. room at the table with us today as well. Um, <laughs> so, um, Kojo, um, Adriana mentioned scarcity in back home backbone. Can you help? <laughs> I, I, I believe we're already helping. Actually, it's been good to hear um, how many people have spoken about ac open access networks and the need for us to do that and the need for backhaul, whether financed by government or the private sector in order to reduce the cost or the end cost to consumers. Again, I could wax lyrical about our efforts. Uh, uh, all, our, all our work, all the investments we've made in places like uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo, Uganda, South Africa, Nigeria, have all been done on an open access basis in enabling any operator who wishes to, to connect and to provide those services and hopefully reduce the cost of those services in, in the in the um, in the final mile, but I have to admit, um, sitting here and hearing not only Japan's success over the years, uh, amazing numbers to see 99.9 percent, .9 and the goal to get to 100 percent in the near future, as well as Lithuania's, and having read the uh, the UN Broadband Commission's recent report, which outlines that at least 95 percent of the world's population is now can now access a broadband network. I think the investments that Meta continues to make in infrastructure are important, but just as important, and my friend from the APC touched on much of it, is, the, is, is how we attract people, how we get people to use the services. Affordability, and I'm, I know, again, I'll, I'll embarrass her slightly, my friend Onika there, who works for the Global uh, Digital uh, in, 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 um, Inclusion Partnership, on which I am a board member for True Transparency. Uh, continues to work on, on issues of affordability as well as what else brings people. And I think Meta does a great job here of not only in investing to create affordability and increase it, but then the other bits. How do we ensure creators are on platforms that attract people to the internet? How do we ensure that the internet or services are in particular languages? These are all parts that Meta are playing really important roles in. How do we then prioritize small to micro-sized uh, businesses who uh, are really prevalent in my region, Africa, Middle East, uh, Tur and Turkey. How do we get them on platform? How do we get them to receive or to, to garner the kind of benefits of using the internet that we all know are possible? And then last but not least, and returning to the point, is how do we continue stimulating investment in networks and the networks at the last mile, those networks in the, in the access gap? And I think that's where Meta is playing, a, again, a, a fantastic role. I know I only have two minutes. I'm here for the next four days and very, very happy to discuss these issues with anybody that wants to speak to me. Thank you very much. And that's actually uh, the perfect lead up to Alejandro. So, you know, on the question of how, you know, do you stimulate investment in networks? Um, so what's the plan of Onnet Fibra? Can you tell us a bit more about that? 
Thank you. <clears throat> yes, it's important for the economy and the social development to have a broadband networks. So in the, in the telecommunication world, fiber to the home has become the standard for delivering a such a ultra fast internet speeds directly to homes. However, its deployment is sometimes hampered by a lack of competition of and a shortage of infrastructure. So the open access network helped overcome these challenges by boosting the viability of FTH and for three competition in the sector and doing, doing it in an efficient way. Uh, to promote investment, it is important to publicize the benefits of fiber optic providers such as our company. This considers several key aspects such connectivity, market rivalry, innovation, development, and the positive impact they bring to the society. The growing popularity of open access networks has raised hopes for a more connected and competitive future. Governments, regulators, and industry stakeholders must recognize the potential of open access models and are currently taking steps to encourage their adoption. With the appearance of neutral networks, there is no need to deploy multiple networks, one on top of the other, to all of different services providers to compete for customers. Instead, a single network is enough for many or maybe all the service providers to reach the market. So neutral network networks bring about deployment and sorry, and operation and maintenance efficiency to the model and will allow service provided to address the resources on customer service. By promoting open access networks, regulators can create a dynamic env environment in which service providers compete on quality and price, resulting in better connectivity options for customers. This approach fosters innovation and drives the rapid development of FTH infrastructure providing individual, individuals and business with faster and more reliable internet access. So this is basically basically what we are doing here in Colombia to deploy a open access, a neutral, fiber neutral networks. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Alejandro. And so what we'd like to do at the OECD is, you know, we use the Internet Governance Forum to then bring um, all the ideas we gathered here back, you know, to our member countries, um, to our next meetings, which are happening in November. So, uh, and since we also want to leave a bit of time um, for discussion, uh, I'd like to do a very short round um, among the panelists. So, you know, if you had to give me your top three in terms of priorities for governments and regulators, you know, what's next? What would those be? So maybe around 30 seconds each, and then we open the floor for discussion. Maki. Uh, I will keep my intervention short. And actually, I prepare only two priorities. <laughs> and so one priority Perfect. is <laughs> so one priority is to support technological development and also to develop our legal scheme uh, in line with it. And for example, uh, the recently uh, we uh, the, uh, the companies develop uh, virtual networks, and but our current regulation is based on the physical networks. And so we think that this kind of legal uh, approach, uh, the advance is is also important. And second. Second uh, priority is, as uh, Kocha mentioned, actually demand is really important. And so we need um, use cases, especially for the 5G. And so 5G, uh, we actually, I already said like 90% of companies, but uh, actually mainly uh, using low and mid band and not uh, sub six and higher broadband and a uh, higher band. And because it's a use case, and so we uh, the MIC uh, held a study group uh, to discuss about the uh, use cases of 5G, and we talk about the uh, self-driving and also the drone usage, and but still we need, um, we need more discussion. And I hope that in the future, uh, we will see uh, more innovative uh, services uh, which ultra-high broadband um, like 5G uh, will bring. Thank you. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Deputy Minister. What's your take? Uh, once again, a very good insight from colleagues from Japan. Can you hear me? No, okay, great. So um, I, I wanted to. Uh, uh, 
Okay, now, uh, sorry, so once again, several uh, amazing um, the, um, points from Japan. I would just uh, uh, want to agree and to say what we're doing on the demand side in Lithuania. I think uh, this is a crucial point that uh, we're creating this infrastructure. It costs a lot, uh, but the use cases are not there yet. So we are working on the demand side as well, um, because I'm lucky I'm... Um, I'm, I'm a part of transport and communications ministry, so therefore we are a lot uh, working on self-driving uh, cars initiatives, on drones, uh, we, from the legislative perspective, which is already in place in Lithuania, but also we created Sandbox, uh, we dedicated uh, more than 25 million uh, for use cases on 5G. So we creating all the uh, value chain uh, to promote it, to see visibly uh, what can be done with 5G. So it's not only network itself, but really cases of usage. And I think at the end of this year, we'll see uh, large aid projects in different industries in Lithuania by testing 5G on different problems in the society. So I think this is very important. And uh, the other thing... Um, um, to, it's also important to optimize our investments um, uh, as well as to fully revise the legal framework. Uh, what we cannot accept right now that whatever is uh, we are planning, it takes two, three years to to do it. So basically, all the frameworks needs to you know be adjusted if we want to deploy it really fast. If we want to to have it in a couple of years. Uh, we need to move faster. So um, on one side, it's a complaint for the government, so for myself as well, that we need to work on better schemes. Uh, and it's not only about optimizing uh, investments, but it's also about minimizing the periods between when the investments are dedicated. Uh, the whole deployment should be done also faster than we do it now. And of course, synergy with other utilities uh, is absolutely necessary. When we're changing the road, when we're changing other communications uh, within the different infrastructure, we need to, to think about uh, uh, you know, all the broadband uh, communications as well. We have so many cases when uh, one uh, infrastructure is changed, but then the other is not added, and we have huge problems uh, in a couple of years. So I think this is also very practical and crucial in order to move faster. Thank you very much, um, Adriana. We already heard from you, you know, on financial education, um, etc. Uh, anything more that you want to add uh, to your wish list for government? Adriana, could you hear us? So, yeah, I couldn't right. hear you. Could you say that again, please? Yes. Sorry. Uh, your top that. three wish list um, for policymakers. You are mentioned. You already <laughs> mentioned a couple of points. You know, is there anything you would like to add to this wish list? Thank you, Verena. Yes, of course. <laughs> um, in. Community networks need an enabling environment. You know, a simple licensing regime that is not a barrier, that it's a simple registration. They, they need also this affordable access to spectrum and to backhaul. And there are many ways to achieve that. Uh, they also need really good open data. We need to know where any infrastructure is available in rural areas, whether it's it's a, a, a tower, and a, a, a roof, um, an IXP, a point of presence, whatever we need, granular open data maps uh, in, in all the non-urban areas, whereas there, not every country has all these good geographic information systems. We also need a huge re-engineering for universal service funds because under the, this new era, well, the beneficiaries of those funds could be these local operators, both for CapEx, for infrastructure, for capacity building uh, 
programs and also, and, and I'm sorry, I didn't mention this before, all these policies for inclusion should have a gender perspective. Uh, we are in, in Brazil, for instance, we recommended that there's some funding for women led initiatives, uh, women uh, participating actively in community networks in rural areas, in the design uh, or operation, engineering or installation. So you can also promote a gender equality through, through this uh, funding for, for community networks or uh, local networks that where women participate. And, uh, and so this holistic uh, approach uh, enables to lower barriers uh, and of course uh, a good spectrum policy of spectrum sharing. Uh, because there's not more inefficient uh, spectrum than that one that is not used. So spec use it or, or share it policy for spectrum and for backbone networks would be great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adriana. And actually, we have a new project at the OECD where we're looking into mapping and how to improve geographical mapping at more granular basis, because we're quite good doing this at a national level. But then when it comes down to rural and remote area, we're less good. Uh, so the list is getting quite long. Koizu, um, if you have your wish list for the governments, what would that be? I think, I think many of those things have been, many of the things that would be on my wish list have been mentioned already. A quick thing on the, on the mapping, I will say that Meta has created a number of open data if you want to call it that, but open access maps that have been shared with both the World Bank and the UN that are probably the most sophisticated and in-depth population maps that one can find which enable network planning. Um, I, we've heard about tax, spectrum, licensing, uh, the need for gender equality or gender uh, 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 view on things, but I would add youth and people with disabilities to that as well. All of those marginalized groups need to be looked, looked at. But because we're only now two, and I'm already over my 30 seconds, I'd probably go for number one, consultation. Actually, I'll go for free. I'll go for number one, consultation. And people say, mm, we do consult. But the depth of consultation and the predictability of that consultation with given timelines, all stakeholders involved, to me, is incredibly important. I think what stems from that consultation is a predictability that the private sector need most of the time. And that predictability can go two ways. It can go one way, which is policies and regulations that we don't like, but we can actually work with. Or another way, which is policy and regulation that we do like and reflects our point of views that we're even, we're even in a better place to work with, which is important. People may ask, what's my third point? My third point is innovation. And I think some of my colleagues touched on it, whether it's driverless cars or whatever else. The one concern I have is that we have amazing opportunities in front of us that are exciting a lot of people. And you'll be unsurprised when I, when I say the metaverse, artificial intelligence, which I think a number of you are focused on. And my, my plea to governments in my region is not to stifle innovation, because I believe that these uh, technologies, particularly artificial intelligence, and one eye on the sustainable, sustainable development goals, offer us a, a tremendous opportunity. And my, my call for governments is not to stifle innovation in any way, um, or at least try not to. It's difficult, but try not to. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and with that uh, thought on innovation, Alejandro, anything you would like to add uh, on our wish list for governments? Mm, thank you, Verena. Yes. Uh, I think there is a huge opportunity to strengthen connectivity programs in several Latin American countries. I think the, the first one is it's important for policymakers to understand that uh, expanding connectivity goes beyond solving a considerable gap in terms of digital inclusion of ac or access. Quality internet access represents a key element in the economic growth of countries and additionally open new possibility for development in areas so, such as education, health, government, and transportation. On the other hand, it is important that they also understand and make use of the different technologies that can extend connectivity to most people, and which are the best technologies considering the characteristics of the location they need to reach. 
There is no such thing as same size fit all in regard of broadband technologies for access. In the case of FTTH neutral networks, it is important that regulators understand the role of our network plays in breaking paradigms in the traditional way of deploying telecommunication networks in Colombia and in any country in the world. It is important that everyone, not only policymakers, understand that facilitating the use of existing infrastructure reduce cost and also speed up deployment and minimize the investment cost, ultimately benefiting communities since it allows them a simple and agile access to service and technologies. Thank you. Thank you very much. And with this, um, we have a few minutes left, so I would like to open the floor for questions and comments. Uh, I see there are no questions online so far. Do I have questions in the room? Please, Eric. I think you need to turn it on. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. All, all uh, the experiences are very interesting, and uh, I, I'd like to know a bit more about. Um, um, you mentioned something in Lit Lithuania that has a uh, um, government company specifically for rural areas. Could you talk a bit more about that? And also, um, also from the representative of Japan, it would be very interesting to say that there is a fund that uh, it's for um, maintaining rural networks. And if you could tell us more about how does that work as, as well. Thank you. Okay, so finally, somehow we will learn to use it. Um, yeah, so 18 years ago, when Lithuania regained its independence, uh, we started to think how we're gonna, you know, deploy all the broadband. And uh, the idea was very simple. Uh, we need to separate operators uh, and uh, uh, government investments, uh, because we understood that still the majority will be from the government. Because uh, at the end, the users, the last mile should, should be and must be covered by operators. So um, the, this not profit uh, company under our ministry, actually, under my supervision uh, at the moment, uh, uh, was created. And it works very successfully. It do not compete with operators. They work in line on the decisions I had where should be the broadband you know, deployed. Uh, everybody knows in advance uh, plans, each other, they coordinate it. And then everybody knows where their input is needed. So basically when the uh, majority uh, broadband to the rural area is made, the last mile is you know, corresponding on the right timing to finally reach and uh, connect uh, that rural area. Um, yeah, so this is basically what we're doing uh, now, and um, and all the investments uh, on well in, on European level we have EU investments, we have RRF, different investments. So everything what's dedicated for the uh, digital component uh, from the government sides goes through this non-profit organization to the building of towers now to the, all the components uh, necessary uh, to cover the whole country. And of course, we work a lot on the legislation, not only how to cover with 5G, but obviously the density is the most important part. So we did not touch up on this part, but I think this is a very interesting part as well. Thank you very much for the question. And uh, so the uh, universal service system I mentioned uh, is universal service system uh, for the broadband. And it is also similar to the universal fund system to the uh, fixed telephone. And so under this scheme, um, broadband, uh, fixed fix and mobile broadband um, providers have to pay certain amounts. And that amount uh, is decided uh, by the number of the line uh, which they have. For example, if, um, so for example, 
two yen or three yen for each line, and so the each provider have to pay uh, the um, this kind of multiplication, and so the um, their uh, subscribers number and also the uh, certain yen, uh, and they have to um, pay uh, that amount of money to the fund. And that fund uh, collect all the money and uh, allocate uh, some uh, allocate money uh, to the provider, fixed broadband provider, uh, which invest uh, to the um, rural areas. And so, and this is a, uh, and that money is for the maintaining their infrastructure costs. Thank you very much. Do we have one last final question? before we wrap up that panel. I see none. So with this, I would really like to thank our speakers for the very interactive discussion. Um, so we learned a lot, you know, on the different models. Thank you. Uh, on the different models, you know, how, how we can jointly invest in infrastructure, you know, to, to go to the next level, what we haven't achieved yet. Uh, you know, if you have any comments for us, you know, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. And I would really like uh, to thank uh, the team who organized that session. Thank you, Hokuto. Thank you, Max. And I would uh, also uh, like to thank all the technical team. Uh, they are sitting there in the background uh, where our timekeeper and made sure that this hybrid setting, which is not always easy, uh, ran perfectly. Thank you so much. Have a great day, Zero. Bye-bye. <laughs>